Hey guys. Uh, first thing I want to say is Happy New Year. I uh, hope you all of you had a great New Year's holiday and also uh, hope you had a great Christmas and were able to spend time with your families and uh, have a good time, make memories and everything because family is important. And um, it's been uh, about 15 days since I made a video. You know, I've been trying to think of a good way to start the, the new year off with hopefully a good video, a good informative video. And uh, I thought I'd make this one today on basically things to look for when you're collecting military stuff. And really, you know, I'm, I'm really leaning more towards collecting like World War II stuff. Um, I believe this will be at least a two or maybe a three part uh, series, I guess, that I'll do probably over the next, you know, several days or week or so. But it'll definitely be a part two. And um, this one's going to be basically on some jackets and uh, helmets, basically some things to look for. Uh, because, you know, when you first start collecting stuff, I know with me, I wanted anything and everything military. But, you know, after a while, I got to where I became, I consider myself an advanced collector. And uh, I started paying attention more, and uh, after, you know, reading different books and, and doing some research, uh, I kind of learned what's better to look for, you know, to have better quality items in my collection instead of just a bunch of random things, which, you know, that's okay if you want, you know, a variety. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I'm going to bring you in closer here, and I'm going to go over uh, what I got here. So let's go. Okay, so for this video, I chose jackets and basically helmets, and I got a helmet liner there. Uh, like I said, I'll definitely do a, a, a part two, if not a third part, in the next several days or week or so. But um, I want to start here with the marine dress blues, you know, particularly the jacket. Now, um, a lot of times, you know, it can be confusing. You know, little there could be just little bitty changes that could determine what, like if something, say, World War II or post-World War II or, or whatever... But I want to say the, the World War II Marine Dress Blues, they did not have pockets on the front. Now, you'll see a lot of dress blues, they'll have two breast pockets and two lower pockets. And the four pocket, you know, that didn't come into play until 1946, which we all know World War II ended in 45. Uh, so, like I said, if you wanted to know if your uh, Marine Dress Blues was World War II, you can't find a tag or any markings. Like I said, if it's like this one right here... You see, this one has no pockets on the front at all. This one is a World War II issued, uh, you know, Marine dress blues. Now, a lot of the Marines had their, their dress blues tailored specifically for themselves. And so there might be, you know, an exception where, you know, somebody might have had pockets added. But as, as a whole, the Marine dress blues didn't add all the pockets on the front until 1946. So that would be a post-World War II dress blues jacket. But um, I just thought this would be a good start here. Um, like I said, there's just so many different variations of jackets and uniforms and stuff. It just, you, there, there's no way to know it all. You know, just, we got to kind of learn as we go. But I thought I'd do the, the field jackets now. You got the M43, and then you got the M1950, which obviously the M43 would be World War II, and the M1950 uh, would be Korean War. Now, they look identical. You know, if you've ever looked at both of them, you know, I'm trying to, do a side-by-side -side comparison here. See, the buttons are the same. Uh, the pockets are the same. You know, the difference is between an M43 and an M50 is, look on the inside here. The M1950 had where, you know, buttons added on the inside where you could button in uh, a liner. If you see, it's not in this M43. And then there was also like a difference with the sizing and everything and the jackets. But as far as, you know, appearance, what we look at, the difference you could tell would be, like I said, the M1943 has no buttons on the inside for the button-in liner. And then, like I said, the M1950 does. So that's the main difference right there. Something simple like that, which is always good, you know, to look for tags. And you can even see this one. You see it's an M1950 right there. And uh, this one's, an, uh, like I said, an M1943, model 1943. You know, it was there, but I'm sure it faded off and wore out over time. But that's your difference right there. So, like I said, if you've got one with the buttons on the inside, it's a, it's an M, you know, model 1950. And then if you've got, uh, without the buttons, you've got you a, a World War II uh, model 1943. And then uh, I thought I'd do helmets, you know, with the, the uniforms. Now... 
you know, most people know that, you know, or, you know, as far as who've been collecting for a while, know that front seam helmet, which is basically where the rim meets right there, the split, would be definitely World War II, right? And there's even people that say only World War II helmets had front seams, and that is not true at all. I'm not saying they're liars, but they're mistaken. Because the, the rear seam started in late 1944, around October or so, is when the rear seam started. So if anybody tells you if you got a rear seam helmet, it's automatically not World War II, that's not true. But definitely when you're looking for helmets, you know, uh, I, I love front seam, which I've got some rear seam World War II helmets, not many, but... You know, look for the front seam right there. You know, that's something to look for. You know, they're somewhat more desirable in some people's opinion. Um, the front seam compared to the rear seam. This is the McCord here. But, um, so that's just a little tip there. Like I said, if you pick up a helmet, first thing I look for, is, you know, is the is the seam. Where's it at on the helmet, right? Now, there, when it comes to the bells, you know, there's the swivel bell and the fixed bell, right? And we know there was two companies... McCord and Schluter that made World War II helmets, right? Now, this is a Schluter here, and what makes this one so special is, check this out. Now, these are desirable. They're not really rare, but they're desirable. This is a Schluter, right? But, look, fixed bell. Now, the reason the Schluter fixed bells are more desirable than the McCord fixed bells is because... Uh, the Schluter helmets, they came into production. They started making them in January of 1943. And around October of 1943 is when swivel bells, you know, helmets were starting to be produced. And, you know, there were a lot of fixed bell helmets that, you know, originally were fixed bell, and they, they got uh, remodified, refurbished, and they were switched to swivel bells. And so what makes this special is, like I said, they the Schluter actually made fixed bell helmets were made from January to around the end of September, 1st of October. So for roughly about nine to 10 months only were these made, whereas the McCords were made from the end of June, 1941 until, you know, around October, 1943. So they were made for uh, a little over two years, whereas these were made about nine to 10 months, you know, somewhere in that range. So you can find you a Schluter, which we know the Schluters have the S right here. Where the, you know, underneath the heat stamp be S, unless it's faded or wore out, which that happens. Uh, if you can get you a front seam, then you've got something. I've got uh, 10 Schluters in my collection, and only two of them are fixed bells. The other eight are swivel bells. Actually, one of them is missing bells altogether, but the other seven are swivel bells. But So that's something to look for. And uh, lastly, for this video, uh, I got a World War II helmet liner. A lot of people question on whether or not their liner is World War II or post-World War II. We'll flip it over and look. See, this has the khaki, which the khaki is designated OD3, Olive Drab 3, right? Which is the khaki. So this is definitely a World War II liner, which, you know, a lot of people know by the, the uh, markings in the crown, which I'm not going to get in that today. But So if you've got a liner with, you know, the tannish khaki webbing, it's called, on the inside, then you've got a World War II liner. If it's a darker green, basically similar to, you know, the jacket color here, it's a darker green, like this chin strap here then that's considered OD7, Olive Drab 7, and that would be post-World War II. And they started that, you know, that would have been like Korean War, um, you know, on up through Vietnam. So like I said, if, you, if you're if you really wanting to only collect World War II stuff, then definitely look for the liners with the khaki lining. If Like I said, if it's the dark green, it's post-World War II. Now, a lot of World War II shells, like basically the molds, were left over after World War II, and they were reused... Uh, in you know in basically issued in during the Korean War in the early 50s and they would have had the green OD7 webbing added to them but so that's how you that's how you know you got a World War II liner that's something to look for but anyways guys I'm gonna wrap this video up uh, I look forward to making many more videos this year and um, I actually joined Twitter about a week ago and honestly I haven't been very active on there I'm gonna get better about that as I kind of uh, you know um, learn more about it and everything because I've never really been a Twitter person. But follow me on Twitter, Instagram. If you're watching this video and haven't already subscribed, please subscribe. More videos are on the way. Thank you guys so much for all the support. It's going to be a great year. Thank you.